How's everyone tonight? Let's try it again. How's everyone tonight? Great. My name is Chris Sable, and I'm the executive director for the Vail Symposium. Thank you so much for coming out. I know there are a million choices in July in our community of things to do. You chose wisely, and thank you for doing so. Eric Maddox was a rookie interrogator in 2003 when he was assigned to a Delta Force team in Tikrit, Iraq. Over a period of five months, Staff Sergeant Maddox would conduct over 300 interrogations and collect the intelligence which directly led to the capture of Saddam Hussein. For that, he was awarded the National Intelligence Medal of Achievement, the Defense Intelligence Agency Director's Award, the Legion of Merit, and the Bronze Star. In 2004, Eric left the enlisted ranks of the military, and he was hired as the first ever civilian interrogator for the Defense Intelligence Agency. During his 15 years as an interrogator for the U.S. Army and the DIA, he deployed eight times to include multiple deployments in Iraq and Afghanistan. He conducted over 2,700 interrogators of prisoners from 25 different countries. He now lives in his hometown outside Tulsa, Oklahoma. He had a program yesterday in Dallas and just drove in today with his family. We're so pleased that he could join us. Please give a warm welcome to Mr. Eric Maddox. In 2003, the United States went to war in Iraq. And at that time, I was a staff sergeant in the United States Army. I was a trained interrogator. But I had never actually conducted a live interrogation. See, along with being a trained interrogator, the United States Army had also taught me Chinese Mandarin. And for years, the Army had decided that I was much more valuable as a Chinese Mandarin linguist than I would ever be as an interrogator. So in 2003, when the United States invaded Iraq, I was stationed in Los Angeles, California. I was responsible for conducting interviews of any Chinese citizens who attempted to illegally enter the United States through our ports. And I was told that my work with the Chinese was so valuable that I would never, ever be sent to Iraq. <laughs> so you can imagine the shock I felt when three months into the war, I showed up to my office in Los Angeles, like any other day, and my commander hands me orders for Baghdad. And I asked him, I said, are, are they sending us linguists to war? In L.A., there were 10 of us, and we each spoke a different language. And he said, Eric, those orders are just for you. I said, to what group? What unit am I supposed to go to war with? And he said, Eric, the orders are top secret. They do not say. So in 2003, I'm a staff sergeant in the Army, and we sergeants, we look after the privates. They're the new guys. And we always tell the privates, we say, listen, if y'all don't know something, just ask. We even have a saying, we tell them, there are no stupid questions. And I remember standing there holding those orders to Iraq, thinking to myself, I'm fixing to ask my boss a really stupid question. I said, sir, do they speak Chinese in Iraq? <laughs> He said, no. I said, what am I supposed to do? He said, Eric, I don't know. But I accepted the orders, and 10 days later, they put me on a military aircraft for the Baghdad International Airport. And when I get there, I am picked up by this team of soldiers. But they're all wearing civilian clothes, and they have full beards. And they put me in their truck, and they drove me through the huge Baghdad International Airport, and we go into this really fortified-looking compound, and we go into this building, and of course there's no windows. We go inside this room, we sit down at a table, and across the table, one of the bearded soldiers looks at me, and he said, are you familiar with JSOC? I said, Jay, what? I, I, I don't, is that a word? He said, JSOC, it is the Joint Special Operations Command. 
said, that sounds really cool. I don't know what that is. They said JSOC, Joint Special Operations Command. It's the United States Military Task Force responsible for tracking down the most wanted people on Earth. And ever since the United States invaded Iraq, the most wanted man in the world was Saddam Hussein. He was the ace of spades. And I don't know if y'all remember, back in 2003, the Department of Defense, they created that deck of playing cards. And it was Saddam and his whole senior regime member. One of the bearded soldiers said, Joint Special Operations Command, their exclusive mission in this war is to track down and kill or capture every single person on the deck of cards, mainly Saddam. And I'm sitting there, obviously in shock. And I said, well, that's awesome. <laughs> I'm serious. And I cannot think of a better group of guys to have that mission than you all. <laughs> with your beards and everything. I said, what do you want with me? I'm a Chinese Mandarin linguist. They said, you're a trained interrogator. I said, y'all know I've never done an interrogation before in my entire life. What am I doing here? And one of the bearded soldiers said, you're an airborne ranger. See, when I first enlisted in the Army back in 1994, I enlisted as an infantryman. I served at the 82nd Airborne Division. I was a paratrooper, and I went and graduated from the United States Army Ranger School. One of the bearded soldiers said, Eric, we are the interrogators for the Joint Special Operations Command. We have Delta Force teams spread all through Baghdad going on five raids a night looking for Saddam Hussein. He said, they are flooding us with prisoners. He said, but we also have interrogators. We have Delta Force teams out there, out in the badlands of the country. He said, these Delta Force teams, they keep calling us up, and they want us interrogators to go out there with them on the raids. He said, Eric, we're, we're not infantry. So we called the Army, and we said, listen, give us a list of every single interrogator who's also a qualified ranger. He said, man, you were the only one on the list. That's what I was going to do. I was going to join this task force and help him track down everyone on the deck of cards. i had been there three days, and the senior interrogator comes to me and he said, Eric, Delta Force team in Crete, they called, and they're going on a raid tonight. And they asked for an interrogator. Obviously, we're sending you. I said, all right, you know, I'll go. I, I feel obligated to tell you. I cannot think of anyone less qualified <laughs> to go on that raid tonight than me. I am a Chinese Mandarin linguist. I just got here. And the senior interrogator said, Eric, relax. He said, there's something you have to understand about Tikrit, Iraq. He said, it's Saddam Hussein al Tikriti. It's Saddam's hometown. And Tikrit is this little bitty town right in the middle of the Sunni Triangle. It's 20,000 citizens. He said, Eric, when we invaded Iraq, we thought Tikrit was so valuable. We dropped 15,000 soldiers in Tikrit. We've gone through every single house. We haven't found anybody on that deck of cards in Tikrit in weeks. He said, Eric, Tikrit doesn't matter. But we still have a Delta Force team up there, and when Delta Force asks for something, Delta Force gets it. He said, they want an interrogator on tonight's raid. He said, you'll be home tomorrow. So that night, I grabbed a single change of clothes, I grabbed my weapon, they put me on a helicopter and flew me to Tikrit. And I am picked up by this Delta Force team. And they cooked me to their cool little Delta Force house inside the U.S. compound and they're planning a raid. And they gave me the names, the individuals they, look, they were looking for, and an hour later, we jump in their trucks and we leave the wire. And in the middle of the night, they drive up alongside these houses in these neighborhoods in Tikrit, Iraq, and they jumped out and they raided it. They blow down the front gate and they go in there, and a few minutes later, they asked me to interrogate the adult males. And we didn't go on one raid, we went on a second and we went on a third. We were out doing raids all night long. And as the sun's coming up, 
we're going back inside the wire and I'm thinking to myself, okay, that will be the craziest day of my life. That's, that's the night I did raids with Delta Force and they're going to send me back and I can get back with those interrogators in Baghdad. The next morning, the Delta Force commander, he came to me and he said, Eric, I've been asking for an interrogator in Crete for weeks. He said, now that I've got one, he said, I can't let you leave. <laughs> he said, you're going to stay with us. I said, okay, sir, what do you need me to do? He said, Eric, there is nobody on the deck of cards in Crete. He said, but we are at war. He said, every single day we drive through the cities and everyone waves like they love us Americans and at night they're blowing up our, our, our units. He said, we have no idea who the enemy are. He said, Eric, the U.S. Army has a prison here in Crete, and there's hundreds of detainees. He goes, I want you to go down there every single day, get a couple of prisoners, bring them back to our Delta Force house. We'll give you a room. We'll give you a linguist, a translator. He goes, and you interrogate him. He says, I want you to interrogate every single prisoner in Crete, and you figure out who the bad guys are. And to me, that mission was clear. And the next day, I went and got a couple of prisoners, and I brought them, and I brought the first one in. And I'd never done an interrogation before, but I had been trained by the United States Army. I had received the best interrogation training in the world. And I told myself, trust the training. And I will tell you, the Army did not teach and does not teach torture. But I will also tell you this, it is a zero-sum game technique. It's based on intimidation. It's based on the notion that we need to talk over these individuals. And they always taught us, don't listen to the prisoner. They're going to try to lie to you. Don't listen to them with conviction and authority. You, mean, you need to make that prisoner believe that you know everything about them. And the idea is that the prisoner goes, uncle, you got me. Here's everything I know. And I brought the first prisoner in and I started talking to him, talking to him. And I was using the army techniques. And after an hour, I realized this prisoner's not going to break. He's not opening up. I went a second hour and the prisoner had shut down on me. And I tried for hour after hour and I couldn't get any, anywhere with this prisoner. And I put him aside and I brought the second prisoner in. I told myself, Eric, you are working for Delta Force. You cannot let these guys down. And that second prisoner, I interrogated him for five hours and nothing. The techniques were not working. And that first week, I went through 20 prisoners. I was spending 15, 16 hours a day. And after 20 prisoners, I didn't get a single prisoner to open up. And I went down to the, to the prison, and I asked the other interrogators. I said, what, what are you guys doing to get these prisoners to talk? He said, Eric, none of the prisoners are talking. I said, why? He said, I don't know, maybe living under the wrath of Saddam Hussein, our intimidation doesn't have any effect on them. Maybe there's a, just a difference in the American and Iraqi culture. And I went back to that Delta Force house, and I told myself, there is no way this is what the Army wants me to do. <laughs> to spend my entire six-month tour out here using these techniques that do not work. I said, I do not know how to get these prisoners to open up. But I have got to find a way to connect with them. I told myself, I'm bringing a prisoner in tomorrow, and I'm going to start talking to him. And I'm going to see how long can I keep him talking. Just, just keep him talking. And I sat this prisoner down, and I just started asking him questions about his life and his family and what it was like to grow up and live under the wrath of Saddam Hussein. And he would talk to me. He would answer my questions. And I could have this conversation with him. And I started to realize, you know what? If I, if I quit looking at this guy as the enemy and really listen to him, he's actually, he opens up more about his responses. He didn't break, he didn't confess, he didn't provide me intel, but I kept him talking all day long. And the next day I did the same thing and I started to realize, you know what? If I sit down with these prisoners and I remove all the distractions from my world, it allows me to put myself in the shoes of my prisoners. And if I can do that, they'll start to open up and talk to me. And I also realized that if I can completely remove all the distractions from my mind and my world, put myself in that prisoner's shoes, when I have these conversations, 
I can tell exactly when a prisoner lies to me. I can talk to a prisoner for three hours and tell you exactly the five, six places where they lie. And I thought, maybe this is what interrogation's about, to find these lies. Maybe somehow that's important. And one day I'm talking to this prisoner. We've been going for two straight days. I knew exactly where he'd lied to me. And the second day, the prisoner looks at me and he said, Mr. Interrogator, he said, I'm innocent, man. When are you going to let me out of here? And I said, you're innocent? He said, I have not told you a single lie. I said, you haven't lied to me? He said, Mr. Interrogator, if I've lied to me, he said, you can kill me. I said, well, I can't kill you, but I'll make a deal with you. If you hadn't lied to me, not one single lie, I'll let you walk out that door. You can go home right now. But if you've lied to me, if you told me one single lie, you spend the rest of your life in this prison. And he's kind of sizing me up. He said, I, I haven't lied to you. I said, not one lie. And you walk. One lie and you stay forever. He said, I haven't lied. I said, how many brothers do you have? He said, I told you. I have three brothers. And I said, you have four. And his jaw just drops. I said, you said you're a farmer. How much farmland do you own? He said, I told you, I own 80 acres of farmland. And I said, you own over 200 acres of farmland. And the blood completely rushes out of my prisoner's face. And he's sitting there and he's shaking. I looked at him and I said, what was our deal? What was our deal? What was the deal we just cut? And he's shaking and he looks at me and he said, can we cut a new deal? I said, yeah, yeah, here's the new deal. You cannot tell me you spend every single day of your life in this little bitty town and you don't know who any of the bad guys are. I need to know who's attacking our forces or you spend the rest of your life in this prison. And he said, I don't know them all. He said, but that fourth brother, he said, you don't understand how it works in my neighborhood. There's this group and they recruit the young men and they make them join and they made my little brother join. And he said, it's, it's, a, it's a group, and it's these three guys are running the group in my neighborhood. And he gives me their names, and he gives me their exact locations. And I went to my Delta Force commander. His name's Bam Bam. I went to Bam Bam. I said, I think I just got you intel. I think I've got you targets, and they'll actually be there if we go. He said, Eric, we'll hit all three. Give them to me. And we, that night, we raided all three of the locations that that prisoner gave me. And we finally captured, we captured all three of the individuals. We finally got some, somebody we were looking for. And I brought the prisoners in one at a time, and I told myself, just talk to them. Just listen to them. Put your world behind you, and just listen to them. And I did. I started to talk to them, and I figured out where they were lying to me, and then I found a way to make that connection. And by the time the sun's coming up, those prisoners had explained more about their information on the insurgency. And they said, listen, there's accountants, there's logistics, there's recruiting. And they started to lay out their section of the insurgency. And we had more targets. And Bam Bam and the team, every night, they would raid every single target that I could come up with. And we'd start the process and I would interrogate those prisoners. And I did one single thing. I brought those prisoners in. I put my world, my biases behind me, and I simply talked to them. And they told me what direction to go. And if I listened to them clearly, I knew exactly what they were lying to me about. I knew exactly what they were afraid of. And I knew how to solve their problems. And as we did this week after week, we started to create a link diagram of the insurgency through the Sunni Triangle. And it got up to 500 names. And then it got up to 1,000. And after three months and 200 interrogations, our link diagram had over 2,000 names on it. And after three months and 200 interrogations, we finally realized that the entire link diagram was being controlled. The entire network was being controlled by one man. His name was Mohammed. Ibrahim. And Muhammad Ibrahim was a former inner circle bodyguard of Saddam Hussein. Saddam Hussein, he had hundreds of bodyguards. 
Every single one of them was from Saddam's hometown of Tikrit. After all these interrogations, I knew who all the bodyguards were, but none of them were involved in the insurgency, except for one guy, and that one guy was running the entire show. And from that point, instead of doing raids across the, across the low-hanging fruit, every interrogation, every raid we conducted was to capture a friend, a business partner, a relative of this Muhammad Ibrahim. And we finally captured Muhammad Ibrahim's top business partner. And when I talked to him, we connected, and he broke. And he looked at me and he said, you, you've been missing the easiest way to get him this whole time. He has a driver, and Muhammad Ibrahim's driver knows everything. And I told him, I said, you got to take me. And the, and the prisoner looks at me and he goes, you got to be kidding me. You don't know. He said, the driver of Muhammad Ibrahim sitting at his home right now. You can go pick him up. I said, how's that possible? And the prisoner said, Muhammad Ibrahim, the head of this insurgency, his driver lives right next to the governor of Tikrit. Tikrit, Iraq, it's the heart of the Sunni triangle. Saddam Hussein Sunni. We kick Saddam, the head Sunni, out of power. All people in Tikrit hate us. We had to put a puppet governor in to be the governor of this section of Iraq, of Tikrit. That poor puppet governor, I think the CIA paid him millions of dollars to take the job. But he was our guy. And the prisoner says, listen, Muhammad Ibrahim's driver lives right next to that governor. The person said, because Muhammad Ibrahim's driver, his cousin, is the head of security for the governor of Tikrit. Everybody wanted to kill that governor. The only reason that governor was alive is because that head of security had hundreds of bodyguards. That head of security was the United States government's best friend. And my prisoner's telling me that the driver of my bodyguard, his cousin, is that head of security for the governor of Tikrit. Are you guys tracking? <laughs> and I went to Bam Bam, and I said, Bam Bam, we found the driver of Muhammad Ibrahim. The driver knows everything. We can go pick him up right now. He's at his house. And Bam Bam said, good job, let's go. I said, funny story. <laughs> Muhammad Ibrahim's driver lives right next to the governor of Tikrit. Because Muhammad Ibrahim's driver's the cousin of the head of security. And Bam Bam said, you mean the head of security that at the Pentagon, they call that guy chief? He said, Eric, you can't touch the head of security of the governor of Tikrit. And you can't touch any of his family member. And if you're telling me the head of security of the governor of Tikrit's cousin is Muhammad Ibrahim's driver, you ain't touching Muhammad Ibrahim's driver. I said, Bam Bam, I can't take down this insurgency without the driver. He said, I'll go get the driver. He goes, we will get shut down in a day. This whole thing needs to go down fast. And that night, Bam Bam and that Delta Force team went and arrested the driver of Muhammad Ibrahim. And as I'm interrogating him, first five hours, all he's telling me is how much trouble he's in because his cousin's the head of security. And then after five hours, he kind of looks at me and he said, you were supposed to be gone by now. He goes, you're the interrogator in the blue shirt. They are going to kill you. When I first got to Tikrit, I was supposed to be there one night. I took a single change of clothes, and my single change of clothes was a pair of khaki pants and a short sleeve baby blue button-down shirt. So I had to wear the army uniform for all those raids we were going on. So every single interrogation I conducted, I'm wearing this short sleeve baby blue button-down shirt. And I got a reputation within the insurgency as the interrogator in the blue shirt. But he said, you were supposed to be gone by now. Everybody in the Joint Special Operations Command goes on 90-day deployments. They're 90 days and they rotate out. They put me on a 180-day deployment. I was past my 90 days. And when he said, they're going to kill you, you were supposed to be gone by now. I knew. I told him. I said, you're with Saddam. No one would know that. Muhammad Ibrahim wouldn't know that. You wouldn't know that. 
Only Saddam would know that. And I told the driver, I said, you have no idea how much trouble in. I don't care who your cousin is. You will never see the light of day until you take me to Saddam. And the driver said, I don't know where he is. He said, there's only one man that actually knows where Saddam Hussein is. He said, and that's my boss, Muhammad Ibrahim. He said, I'm Muhammad Ibrahim's driver. I deliver millions and millions of dollars. I delivered dollars and orders of attacks throughout the Sunni triangle. Every week I take the orders from Muhammad Ibrahim and he's taking all orders from Saddam. And I said, where is Saddam Hussein? And he said, I don't know, but Muhammad Ibrahim does. And the driver said, listen, every single night I drop Muhammad Ibrahim off at one of five safe houses. He will be at one of those five safe houses tonight. And he gave me all the locations and all the names. And I went to Bam Bam and I said, the driver just broke. We're going after Saddam. I got five safe houses. Muhammad Ibrahim will be at one of those tonight. If we get Muhammad Ibrahim, he could take us to Saddam. And Bam Bam looks at me and he said, we're shut down. He said, we should not have arrested the cousin of the head of security of the governor of Tikrit. He said, headquarters has shut us down as of tomorrow. And they said, he said, Eric, you're being sent home early. If you're asked to leave war early, things are not going well. They often ask you to stay longer. If you've been told that we're all set without you, things are not going well for your deployment. I said, well, bam, bam, I got five safe houses. What are you going to do? And he said, we're shut down as of tomorrow. We'll hit all five houses tonight. And that night, Bam Bam and the team raided all five of the safe houses of Muhammad Ibrahim. And he wasn't at any of them. And he brought me back all the prisoners. He brought me back 40 prisoners to our house. And Bam Bam told me, he said, we got till the morning. And what used to take me hours, I could break them in minutes. And the prisoners quickly told me, they said, yep, this was a safe house. Muhammad Ibrahim was staying here. And another prisoner said, listen, you, you pushed him out of Tikrit. He went to the town of Samara. And another prisoner said, listen, in Samara, Muhammad Ibrahim has a subcommander. It's this guy. I know where he lives. And I went to Bam Bam and I said, those were five good raids. We're, we're on him. We just pushed him to the subcommander's house. I said, Bam Bam, we got one more raid. Just one more raid. He said... All right, we got time for one more raid. And they went and they raided the sub-commander's house in Samara. And Muhammad Ibrahim wasn't there. And he brought me back, the prisoners. And I began talking to him. And one of the prisoners quickly broke. And he said, he was never here. He just rented a house. Muhammad Ibrahim rented a house a couple of blocks away from our house. He's there right now. And I went to Bam Bam and I said, man, one more raid. We got one more raid. And Bam Bam said, how much more shut down can we get? He goes, last raid. And we went and we finally found the rental house of Muhammad Ibrahim and we raided it. And he wasn't there. His 20-year-old son was. It was the right house. He just wasn't there. And Bam Bam brought me back the kid and he said, we're done. I said, Eric, your flight leaving to Baghdad's tonight at 8 o'clock. I had one day, and I told myself, just talk to this kid. This is Muhammad Ibrahim's 20-year-old son. Just talk to him. Just connect with him. And within two hours, the son tells me, he said, listen, my dad was here. He was here three hours ago. How would I know where he went? And I thought, there's got to be something. Get a clue get something. I started talking to this kid and we really connected. And then he, we kind of connected too much because he kind of breaks down and starts crying because I guess he and his dad relationship wasn't that good at the time and tells me he wished things were like when they were little. He said, I wish we could go fishing like when we were little. And I said, where'd y'all go fishing? He said, along the Tigris River. I said, where do they fish? He said, they just built a pond next to the Tigris River. They fish next to the pond. And when the boy told me, they just built a pond, 
one of the first interrogations I conducted into Crete, we captured Saddam Hussein's cook. This guy cooked every single meal for Saddam for eight straight years. And when I interrogated the cook, the cook didn't care. He said, Saddam, he just likes one thing, really. It's this dish. It's a fish dish. It's called mazgouf. He said, I make the best mazgouf in the world. I'm Saddam Hussein's cook. And when the boy said they just built a fish pond, why would you build a pond during the middle of a war? Unless you couldn't go to the market and buy fish because the United States had occupied your country. And I went to Bam Bam and I told him the whole story. And I said, man, we got to do one more raid. <laughs> and Bam Bam said, man, we're going to raid a fish pond. I said, yeah. He said, all right, this will be our team's last raid. You are going back to Baghdad tonight. And that night at midnight, Bam Bam and that Delta Force team raided a fish pond in Samara. And Muhammad Ibrahim was not there. Bam Bam said, Eric, I got two fishermen. He said, get all these prisoners out of the house. Your helicopter's waiting. You're leaving. You're going to Baghdad. I'll drop you off the fishermen. And he gave me those fishermen. I said goodbye to that team, and I left. And when I got back to Baghdad, they told me, yeah, we're going to release all your prisoners tomorrow. I said, release? He said, yeah, we, we go after people on the deck of cards here. Who, we told you there was nobody important in Tikrit. Well, you brought us fishermen. I said, I thought I was going after Saddam Hussein. He said, you idiot. In Tikrit? We told you he wasn't in Tikrit. I said, well, what are you going to do with my fishermen? The same thing I'm doing with all your prisoners. Tomorrow they're getting released. But I had one night. And I brought in the first fisherman. And I told myself, just talk to him. Listen to him and connect. And it took me about an hour. Nothing stood out, but I got his story. And I put him aside. I brought in the second fisherman. And quickly I realized their stories are different. And it took me 13 hours, but after 13 hours, I turned the two fishermen against each other, and one of them breaks. And one of the fishermen said, I work for Muhammad Ibrahim. I catch fish out of the river, I put it in the pond. He said, every few days, they come and grab fish out of the pond. And I told him, I said, where is he? Where did he go? And the fisherman said, listen, Muhammad Ibrahim, he has a deputy, a number two. And the fisherman said, that number two's my cousin. And three days ago, Muhammad Ibrahim and his deputy, my cousin, came to me to get the address of the mutual aunt and uncle in Baghdad. He said, I think they went to that house. And I got the location and the address, and I called the Bam Bam of Baghdad, the Delta commander in Baghdad. And I said, sir, I'm the interrogator in Tikrit. I'm Eric Maddox. Boy, we've been going after this Muhammad Ibrahim guy, and it has been a chase. And we pushed him to Samara, and I think we pushed him to Baghdad, and I got a prisoner who will take you to where I think he is. And the commander, the Bam Bam of Baghdad, he listens to me and he said, are you the guy that brought in the fisherman? I said, sir, it's a good hit. He said, Eric, we're pretty busy around here. I'll put him on the list. And that's all I heard. And I am told I'm leaving the country in three days. And over those three days, I waited, hoping they would go on that last raid in Baghdad. And the days came and went. And at 8 o'clock in the morning, my flight is to leave the country on that third day. And at 1 o'clock in the morning, on that third day, the Bam Bam of Baghdad calls into the prison. He said, Eric, we had a slow night. We went on your raid. Muhammad Ibrahim was not there. He said, we can bring you the prisoners from the house if you like. And I said, yeah, bring them in. Let me see what I screwed up. And they brought in four prisoners, pointed to me, the guy that owned the house. I brought the first homeowner in. At 3 o'clock in the morning, my flight leaves at 8 in the morning, and I told myself, just listen to this guy. Find something to connect. And I started talking to the homeowner. And after 30 minutes, I realized this guy is not from Baghdad. This guy's from Tikrit. And it took me another hour. And I finally 
clicked. This is the deputy. This is the deputy of Muhammad Ibrahim. That was a good raid. It took me one more hour. It took me till after 5 a.m. and the deputy finally breaks. And he says, yep, I'm the deputy of Muhammad Ibrahim. I'm like, awesome, that is great. I need you to take me to him. If you can do it in the next 45 minutes, that'll be fantastic. And the deputy looks at me and he said, Muhammad Ibrahim was at that house yesterday evening. And I'm thinking, I just missed him again. That Muhammad Ibrahim is a ghost. And I told the deputy, I said, think, just think, imagine, where would he go? Where would he, where would Muhammad Ibrahim possibly have gone? And the deputy looks at me and he said, Mr. Muhammad Ibrahim was sleeping next to me last night when the soldiers came to that house. And I thought, did they get him? Because those Delta guys don't miss anybody. Did they get him? Did they get my bodyguard last night? And I went to the guards and I said, give me all the prisoners from last night's raid. And there's just three guys sitting on the ground, handcuffed with hoods over their head. And I thought, is one of these guys Muhammad Ibrahim? I'd never seen a picture of him, but I knew exactly what he was supposed to look like. My bodyguard, Muhammad Ibrahim, was supposed to have a chin, like the actor John Travolta. And I went to the first prisoner, and I took off the hood, and that wasn't him. And I lift the hood of the second prisoner, and that definitely wasn't him. And I start to lift the hood of the last prisoner, and before I got it off, I saw that chin, and I looked at him, and I said, you're Muhammad Ibrahim. Man, I've been waiting to meet you. And he looks at me, and in perfect English, he said, you're the interrogator in the blue shirt. He said, I've been waiting to meet you, too. I brought him in the interrogation room. I had 90 minutes before my flight was supposed to leave, and I told myself, don't rush it. Don't force it. Listen to him. I don't know what he's going to say, but there's nobody on this planet that knows this Muhammad Ibrahim better than I do. He will tell you where to go. And I sat him down and I asked him this most simple question in the world. I said, the only thing we can talk about is the exact location of Saddam Hussein. He looks at me and he said, I don't know where that guy is. He said, man, you give me way too much credit. And I knew, I knew how to break him. And I looked at him and I said, I didn't give you any credit. I didn't know who you were before I came to this country. I said, but the 300 prisoners that I've interrogated, the 40 of your family members that you got involved in this insurgency that I have in this prison right now, they give you credit. They give you credit for ruining their lives. And he rolls his eyes. But he wasn't rolling his eyes at me. He was rolling his eyes at Saddam. Saddam had hundreds of bodyguards, and he picked this one guy and got this guy, whole guy's family in a mess. Every other bodyguard got to leave the country. And I looked at Muhammad Ibrahim. I said, what is he going to do for you now? What will he possibly do for you now? And he shakes his head, and I knew, I knew how I was going to get him. I've been waiting. I've been sitting on this. And I looked at him, and I said, your wife had a baby, three-month-old baby. That baby's living at this house. And I gave him the exact house. I said, I've known that baby's been there for three months, and your wife's there. I never went to that house. I never once went to that house. I would not put that baby's life in danger. Who would know better to find you than your wife? And I never went there. Now, what will he do for you? And he finally looks at me and he said, I don't know if I should do it. He didn't say he couldn't do it. He said, I don't know if I should do it. I said, oh yeah, you should. You really, really should. <laughs> and we went back and forth. And he said, I can't do it right now. And at 7.55, they came in and they said, what are you doing here? Your flight's leaving the country. Go. And I looked at him and I said, I know how this story ends. You're going to change your mind. 
I'm leaving. I don't know if you believe me or not. I am leaving the country and nobody thinks you can do this. Nobody's ever going to give you this chance again because they don't know you can do it. I said, you have to do it now. He said, I don't know if I should do it. And I said, you're going to change your mind and I will be gone and it'll be too late. He said, I can't do it. And I said, okay, when I put you away, when you change your mind and you're going to take us to Saddam, make them come talk to you. No one's going to talk to you again. I said, bang on the walls of yourself. Make them come talk to you. I will be gone. And I took, put his hood on him and I took him to his cell and I left. I went and packed my bags and a few minutes later they picked me up and they are driving me to my airplane. And as we're going, the senior interrogator, he said, you got your number one guy on the last day? That's the, that's the Muhammad Ibrahim on top of that link diagram? And I said, yeah. And I thought, who cares? We didn't get Saddam. I wonder if this guy even knows where he is. And we keep driving along and the interrogator said, what'd you do to that prisoner? I said, I didn't do anything to him. Finally, he looks at me and he said, what did you say to the prisoner? I said, I didn't say anything to him. Why? And he said, the guards are freaking out. They think your prisoner's trying to kill himself. He said he won't stop banging his head against the wall of his cell. And I knew he broke. And I jumped out of the truck and I said, hold the plane. And I went back to the cell. I grabbed Muhammad Ibrahim out, took him to the interrogation room. And I said, where is he? And he looks at me and he said, we got to go. We got to go right now. I said, where are we going? He said, I'm going to help you find Saddam. And I grabbed the prisoner. I put him up against the wall. I said, you're not going to help me do anything. You are going to take me. And he grabbed me. Never had a prisoner grab me before. He grabbed me and he goes, you want to go? He goes, you and me, right now, let's go. Mr. Interrogator in the blue shirt. I said, where is he? He said, he's in Tikrit. He's in this little village called Adwar. He said, he is at the farmhouse of a man named Kais, named Jassim. And we got the map, we drew the sketch, and he said, we got to go right now. And I went outside, and the interrogators are back to pick me up. And I told him, I said, prisoner just broke. He's going to take us to the Ace of Spades. And they said, man, go get on the truck. I said, you don't understand. My prisoner knows where Saddam is. They said, really? Man, we've been looking for that guy. Thank you for coming down here and helping us find where is Saddam? And I said, he's in Tikrit. And the senior interrogator said, Stassar, go get on the daggum plane. And I gave him the sketch and the map, and I said, please call Bam Bam. Call Bam Bam and tell him Muhammad Ibrahim's dying to take him to Saddam. And I left. I left the country. And when you're with this task force, they don't just send you home. You got to go to Doha, Qatar, and do a big decla or a declassification debriefing. And the next morning, I show up to another building with no windows, knocked on the door, and a senior officer opens up. He just looks at me and he said, all briefings are canceled. Clunk. I knocked on the door again. And I said, I'm the interrogator from Tikrit. I, I don't think I can leave the country until I give this debriefing. And he pulls me inside and he said, are you Eric Maddox? I said, yeah. And he said, all briefings are canceled because we got him. We got him last night. And I said, how did it happen? And he said, when you left, we called Bam Bam. And Bam Bam and the team jumped on a helicopter, flew to Baghdad, picked up Muhammad Ibrahim, took him back to the house, and planned and executed the raid of the farmhouse of Qais Namik Jassim. And Bam Bam couldn't find Saddam. They look for an hour, and after an hour, Bam Bam goes to the truck, gets the prisoner, gets Muhammad Ibrahim out of the truck, cuts off his handcuffs. Bam Bam said, where is he? And Muhammad Ibrahim walks the team back around the back side of the house, and Muhammad Ibrahim just starts digging at the dirt. He's digging at the sand, and they realize he's trying to dig something up. And Bam Bam and the team moved him aside, started digging, and they realized he was digging up a rope with his foot. 
and they start digging and they realize the rope was connected to a lid. And when they pulled up that lid, there he was, Saddam Hussein. He was found in Crete, the one place everyone said he wasn't. And he was pinpointed by Muhammad Ibrahim, the one guy that he knew would never, ever give up his location. And that's how the United States tracked down the Ace of Spades. Thank you. Before I open this up to Q&A, which I absolutely love, and I want you to know as an interrogator, I love and appreciate all questions. Before I do that, you get to go first, ma'am. The courage to sit on the front row when an interrogator's giving a speech. I would like to fill you in on what happened immediately after that. I was still not allowed to go back to Los Angeles, California. I was sent directly to Washington, D.C. to the Pentagon taken directly to the office of then Secretary of Defense, Secretary Donald Rumsfeld. I briefed Secretary Rumsfeld. They took me then to Langley, to the CIA headquarters, where I briefed George Tenet and the entire Iraqi intel team. They took me back to Secretary Rumsfeld's office, and as we're going in, I'm with these generals and admirals, and Secretary Rumsfeld, pretty hastily, because he makes pretty hasty, quick decisions, said, send Maddox back. Send Staff Sergeant Maddox back. And one of the admirals said, uh, Mr. Secretary, we borrowed Staff Sergeant Maddox from the Army. He's actually a Chinese Mandarin linguist. <laughs> and Secretary Rumsfeld said, where are my interrogators? He said, well, you don't have your interrogators, Mr. Secretary. We just borrow as many as we need from the Army and the Marine Corps. And on the spot, Secretary Rumsfeld said, I want my own and Staff Sergeant Maddox will be my first one. By the time I got back to my office in Los Angeles, California, I had an email from the office of the Secretary of Defense. Secretary Rumsfeld had created 30 civilian interrogation billets that would fall under the Defense Intelligence Agency, which is the intel arm for the Department of Defense. And I was being hired, I was being offered the job to be the first one. I do not know whether or not I had a choice whether or not I took that job, but I took it. I went on for 10 more years as a civilian interrogator for the DIA. I ended up doing a total of eight deployments and 2,700 interrogations of prisoners from 25 different countries. My very first assignment as a civilian, they sent me around the United States, around Germany and Hawaii, and they said, Go to the units and teach this technique. Teach this interrogation technique. And I did. I don't know if I quite understood the technique yet, but I pretty much explained, man, you got to work with these guys, and you got to help them out, and you might even have to release some, but you really got to, you know, work together. You can imagine how that was received. I said, good job, Staff Sergeant Maddox. We're not doing that. We're not helping the bad guys. But my next mission, I went back with the Joint Special Operations Command on another deployment, but this time I had my own team. And I told the team, I said, we're going to do the interrogations my way. And I said, but I need to watch you do interrogations. I've never actually seen anybody else do an interrogation before. And they used the techniques that I was taught. And the prisoners did not break. And I will give you a statistic. Since 9-11 until now, of all the interrogations that are conducted by the Army and the Marine Corps using the old Army techniques, only 4% of prisoners break. But for the next six months, this team and I worked and developed this technique. And this technique comes down to one single, single thing. We listen to our prisoners at a higher level than the rest of the world listens to people. I'll give you another statistic. On average, people, they only listen to 25% of what they hear. Why? Right? Why only 25%? And we studied and studied and studied this, and it came down to there are so many distractions in our world. 
We have so many distractions in our lives, whether it's our cell phone or what I'm going to do after this or the fact that I had a big dinner before this, I'm about to crash, right? Now, all these other things. And then it comes to deeper distractions that we discovered and we put them into categories and we work to be able to eliminate those distractions. But some of the biggest distractions you have in your, in your lives are biases towards individuals you talk to. Think if you have a bias when you're talking to someone going into that. It doesn't prevent you from hearing, but it filters what you hear. And then some of the greatest two levels of distractions that we all face, the two biggest categories. Number one is the agenda that you have going into a conversation. Imagine going into conversation, a business conversation, or cutting a deal, or just some, if you have an agenda, your mind is on that agenda, it distracts you from listening. And the number one distraction that we all face, thinking about what you're going to say next in a conversation. That alone itself can reduce your level of listening by 40%. And what we discover, if you remove these distractions, and you can increase your listening to 50%. But I'm going to give you one more statistic. I've done 2,700 interrogations. This team of 30 interrogators that was created immediately after the capture of Saddam, they've done thousands of interrogations. Our percentage of break, industry standard is four. We break 65% of our prisoners. 65%. It's not because we raise our listening to 50%. We get our listening into the 80s and 90s, and we do it for one reason. We put ourselves in the shoes of the people we talk to. We gain what is called empathy. Please do not confuse that with sympathy. I've never had sympathy for a single prisoner I've ever interrogated. But my job is to get them to open up, and I can't get them to open up if I cannot gain their trust. And what we discovered, if you do this one simple thing, if you listen to people during a conversation and you give them 80 to 90 percent of your listening, you're indicating to them they have your attention. And we discovered that they will, within minutes, go, I trust you because at this moment, you, Mr. Interrogator, or you, person that I'm talking to, you are putting me ahead of yourself. Done. That is the technique. And it's the technique that has changed the way that interrogations are done in the military. And I invite you to ask yourself before I want to get to the Q&A right here, ma'am. And I love it. And I want everyone to think of your questions that you want to ask. But don't think of them too much because that will reduce your listening. <laughs> ask yourself how good of a listener you are. Because if you put those distractions behind you and put yourself into someone else's shoes, it won't just make you a great intelligence collection officer, it will change your life forever because the world will be drawn to you because they will go, oh, you're different than the rest of the world. They see it. They, we know when someone's listening to us and they will be drawn towards you and you will have positive influence over them. All right, ma'am, better be a good one. Did you work with Steve Wooden? Steve who? Wooden. He was with the United States Army, which was a part of uh, the group that went in to capture Saddam Hussein. Was he on Delta Force or JSON? I don't know. Okay. He teaches a, a course called Arab Naming with the Institute of Analytic Interviewing. I don't know that he was on my team. Okay. So okay. I don't know Steve Wooden. Okay. Unless I do, and I just didn't. Yeah. I wasn't listening. <laughs> it's like the worst thing you could say. <laughs> yes, sir. Well, one, I share a background as an infantry staff sergeant. Nice. A different war. Thank you, sir. But my question, I then became a lawyer, a trial lawyer. And have you taught, it seems the techniques that, that you're talking about would be invaluable for trial lawyers in interviewing witnesses. And have you gone to that? level of teaching lawyers well sir and i'm sure as an infantry enlisted staff sergeant all staff sergeants are enlisted but enlisted man up to the rank of staff sergeant um i think you and i can be pretty straightforward and we both know you can't teach lawyers anything <laughs> <laughs> but i've worked with lawyers and desperately, I'm like, come on. If you just listen in these depo just in the depositions, it, it, would just, it, would, it would make your deposition so much easier and effective, they would just do these things. So I would just say, if you are 
not a lawyer, but somebody who goes in with the strategy of questioning, just reduce that strategy because this long outline is just taking away from just listen. They'll tell you where to go on the first answer. They'll tell you everything you need to know. Take it from there. But I don't ever, I would never think to try to teach. Yes, ma'am. How did I know? I love that question, right? How did I know he had four brothers instead of three? I'm listening to my, my prisoner here, and he's talking about his life and all this world. And I noticed, so this prisoner said he had two older brothers, and then him, and then there was a fourth brother that was younger than him. And every time my prisoner would talk about going to a family event, uh, he would say, if he, whoever he rode with in a vehicle, the oldest sibling would drive. But if he was ever riding with his youngest sibling, my prisoner would be driving. So oldest sibling drives. Three years before this interrogation, he said he had gone to the wedding of one of his sisters, and the two older brothers were in the vehicle with their spouses. And he, my prisoner was with his little brother. Yet my prisoner was riding shotgun. I'm missing a brother. There was another older brother above my prisoner. And that, that's how I do it. I, 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 I erase my world and paint a picture in their world exclusive of the, just with, exclusively with the information they give me. And they'll tell me where the holes are if I listen to them. Yes, sir. I didn't mean to go out of order. No problem. Um, I have a question that's really in two parts. It has to do with waterboarding. And were let's get, you, yeah, let's get to the good stuff. <laughs> and were you Somebody waterboarded some... as an Army Ranger? No. But many were. I think the only people who should have been, they weren't, they weren't waterboarded at Ranger School. Okay. Now, Rangers are very sensitive to this. I'm a graduate of the United States Army Ranger School. I have a tab. I did not serve in regiment, 75th Regiment. But they don't get waterboarded there either. Sears School should be the only place that we waterboarded our own people. Okay. Question number one, yes. And the, the other part of that is, is it effective or not effective in your opinion? That's, that's, the, that's what we got to get down to the good question. All we hear about is waterboarding, interrogations, right? They, they torture works. And I'm over here teaching my stuff, right? Torture does not work fractionally as well as my technique. But hear me out. Why did I have to create my new technique? Because the army techniques do not work. They do not work at all. They're stupid. I should have, fl I almost flunked the interrogation course because I, I knew this wouldn't work. But what happens is you go to war and you have all these interrogators. And interrogators, we're nerds, right? We had to learn a foreign language. And then you have the infantry guys that are out there fighting the war and they're getting shot and blown up. And they come back with prisoners. And they go, make, get us intel. But the techniques did not work. You think these interrogators are sit around going, well, don't work. No. What they realized, the infantry guys enjoyed, they, not enjoyed, they needed those prisoners to have a bad day. So the technique wasn't to get intel, it turned to giving them a hard day. Well, imagine where that's going to go. Well, if the hardest day you're going to have is getting waterboarded, then you are successful because you changed the end zone line. But those interrogations do not get intelligence. If they did, I would be open for the debate. It's comical that they say, well, they use torture and they track down bin Laden. It's like, well, then why did it take nine years to find the guy? Because we found Saddam in five months. And we're never ever, I was never asked to go after bin Laden. I don't know why. But don't tell me those work, and I really don't want to hear it from a non-interrogator. If an interrogator wants to tell me torture works, I'll be open for that conversation. But when I see people who have never done interrogations in their life tell me torture works, I'm not a softie. I'm not nice. I don't like these prisoners. If it worked, I'd be open. It doesn't work. But you understand where it got started. Because the army techniques don't work. So if somebody says, what do we do? 
go change the army techniques. They're ineffective. So if you ask me a question I really feel good about, you're going <laughs> to a little passionate on that one. Yes, sir. Oh, yes, sir. All right. Uh, this question comes from you, to you from the good old days in South Vietnam. Okay. Where I was a Marine Corps Corporal E4. Uh-huh. So you still outrank me. <laughs> Simplify. Simplify. How did you know that the translators were accurately translating your question? How did you know they were accurately translating the answer? And how did you know they weren't after hours telling everything that went on in the interrogation to the other side? Because we learned a lot from Vietnam. We did. We, we learned a lot of lessons from good intelligence collection officers. So what we did, sir, was this. All of our linguists, our, ter our interpreters, they, first of all, they're all Sunni. I'm sorry, they're all Shia, so they hated Saddam. They left Iraq after the first Gulf War. Um, they all live in Dearborn, Michigan. <laughs> I'm serious, <laughs> they all live in Dearborn, Michigan. But the three of them, we'd work them all at the same time. One would work, two would sit over, and they really want to compete to see who's the best one. So they were grading and watching each other, and they would be the first to come and go, hey, he's getting sloppy, he's getting lazy. I did have to be careful. You know, they had to, they, a lot of them, they smoked cigarettes, they needed breaks, so I had to be careful of them getting exhausted. But they, what, what we had to be careful with is leaving the room alone with the prisoner, because they hated the Sunni, and they really wanted Saddam. So they had a love of the game. We never, I've never faced a problem like that. Afghanistan is a little bit different. I've done three deployments to Afghanistan. That's a little bit where you're going to see more problems than Iraq. Yes, ma'am. I'm going back to kind of some of the things that you learned. Question for you. With both your civilian interrogators and within the military, I feel like there's this idea that women might be better listeners. Sure. Especially if you talk to my mom. Have you seen a difference between males and females in just maybe baseline listening, and then what techniques you teach? Um, I, I, we, we teach the exact same techniques. There's equal opportunity, at least in the Army, for anybody to be an interrogator, male or female. There, there might be, I've seen slightly better listening from women, female interrogators than male interrogators. I think I've seen about equal ability. I will tell you two of the five best interrogators in the world are females and 40% of interrogators are not females. So there's a little higher percentage of a little bit at the top, the very, very top. Um, I, I haven't seen any of them being better listeners than others. Um, I, it really, it's individually based. I, I have not seen a difference with interrogators. Yes, sir. Uh, first, a comment. I like your shirt. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and, and my question is, so you're sitting in a room with a bad guy, right? So we call him. Yeah. And he's probably annoyed with you and everybody from the United States to say conservatively. So how would that conversation start? I have to start it I have to start all interrogations by appearing as though I need nothing from this prisoner because most prisoners are not happy they're captured they do they they they're afraid they're they're scared right I mean they're they're looking at, if you get rolled up by the United States in a war zone, whatever plan you've had has gone off the rails. So you're in bad shape. But all they're thinking in their mind is, this guy's going to come after me for information. I don't care what he asks. It's bad to tell him the truth. Regardless of if it's good or bad information, don't answer questions because whatever the questions that he wants answers to, that information will hurt my people. So I have to definitely make him think, I don't need you. 
I'm not asking you any questions. I'm just sending you down the line. But then what I'm going to do is these prisoners, because they're civilians and there's no smoking gun, there's no battlefield, in their mind they're going, I wonder how much he, what they really want to know is how much I know. So let's say somebody puts in roadside bombs in the town of Tikrit. He's a local bomb maker, blows up so, and I may sit down with him, look at a file and dossier and go, whoa, you're Bin Laden's driver. Why would I say you're, you're Osama Bin Laden's driver? Not because I think this prisoner is going to go, I'm not his driver. I just blow up people on the side of the road in Tikrit. No, 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 no. No, no, because this prisoner is going to sit there and go, he thinks I'm Bin Laden's driver. He doesn't know I blew up people on the side of the street. All I need to do is prove to this interrogator that I am not Osama Bin Laden's driver. We won't even talk about blowing up roadside bombs. But he's got to prove, he's, he's in his mind, he's going, but I got to prove it to this interrogator. So, Mr. Interrogator, do you mind if I talk to you for a second? Man, I don't want to talk to you. Don't, I'm just a messenger, bro. Don't kill the messenger. No, no, no. I just, listen, I don't know Bin Laden. Whatever. We're all, innocent, we're all innocent around here, right, pal? Same stuff. No, 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 please. Can I just, just talk to you? Ask me anything you want. I don't want to ask you. No, I will prove to you I'm not Osama Bin Laden's driver. Then I'll get frustrated and go... Man, tell me we did not get another innocent guy in here, right? Because I got to give him a little grain of hope. Like I've seen innocent people come, so I'm, I'm susceptible to that. I got to show him that. And then I'll go, you know what? If I'm going to work to get you off, I'm going to have to ask you a gazillion questions. They might be stupid, but you had better not tell me a single lie. If you tell me a single lie, you're out. And all he's thinking is, I'm not Bin Laden's driver. Ask me anything you want. But what I did right there is I said, I don't care what you did out there. I'm putting the trial right here with one lie. I got to catch him in one lie. And I've just changed the stakes of the game. And he wants to talk to me. And he doesn't know what I'm going to And I've, 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 he, I, he's given me permission to ask him anything I want. And that's how you set up an interrogation. I can go anywhere I want with this guy right now. That took five seconds. It's nothing. But interrogations are like flying a plane. The hardest part's getting it off the ground. If I get that plane off the ground, which I just did, I'm going to succeed. Problem with the other techniques is the plane crashes before it gets off the runway, and you don't know you're crashed. And you're never going to get a prisoner to break. Who's next? Yes, sir. I'm a teacher and a coach, so I'm inclined more towards the torture techniques than the <laughs> but I'm really intrigued by this empathy based questioning and I wanted to ask you if we've seen it play out in real time in Helsinki Finland by the uh, former head of the KGB over the last couple of days I have not I, I doubt that we would see any true empathy based listening that would be in front of a camera when they're having those meetings is when they're going to really give because it, it does make you vulnerable to sit, to put your distractions behind you but i bet those two leaders do that with each other behind the cameras but i would say in front of cameras we rarely ever really get to see empathy based listening where those distractions are removed especially when, when, we, when politicians or officials are asked questions by the media, there's zero trust, there's bias, all those distractions come in. So I struggle to watch that sort of reporting because there's no empathy-based listening and it's tough to watch. But behind the scenes, I bet it's pretty phenomenal. Yes, sir. Hello, um, I have a question that um, in, in your interrogations, I'm guessing you're writing things down a lot. Yes, sir. Do you feel that, um, that that could be like a tell on your part when you're writing things down and the person is noticing what you're writing and you got to maybe try to subdifuge it a little bit? I, I, so that's one part. And the second part is um, 
if I'm in, in an interview, like in a civilian setting, and I often find myself wanting to write things down as I'm talking to people, is that, how do I get over that perception of, of like note taking, I guess? Um, and just maybe if you could maybe talk to those points, thank you. So we teach our interrogators, ask one question at a time. Just kidding. Because the prisoner can pick which question to answer. My problem is I'm gonna to struggle to remember both those. So first question, is it a telltale when I'm taking notes? First of all, I do take notes. I'm a lefty. I do take notes during the interrogations because there are statistics that say if you do take notes, you'll listen to 20 per 20% more than people who don't take notes. So if you want to be a better listener, take the notes. Just know if you don't take notes and you begin taking notes, your listening is going to go to the floor because you're, you're not going to listen to anything because it's hard to write and listen at the same time. But once you get it down, you can do it simultaneously. I take notes nonstop because if somebody, if I'm just listening and a prisoner gives me something important and I go, whoa, can you repeat that? That's a telltale. But when I'm taking notes the whole time, they don't care. So if I've set up that interrogation properly and I'm like, eh, you're Bin Laden's driver. No, I'm not. All right, if I'm going to prove this to my boss, let me get the facts straight here. You mind if I take notes? Ask permission to take notes because then you're not hiding anything. And when you take notes, take them nonstop so you don't show anything. But that is a problem. Like if you're not aware of that, you, can sh you don't want to be like, what? <laughs> but yes, on the note taking. Yes, ma'am. Right here. Yeah. I'm s yes, sir. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for your service. Thank you. Um, question I have. <laughs> thank you. Uh, the question I have is when you started giving this lecture or some modification of it, did you receive any blowback from the government? <laughs> Most leaders in the government support and push for me to do this. I've given four lectures, this lecture at West Point in the last two and a half years to every incoming freshman. And the idea is we have to teach our future leaders you can't just go by the book. We need you thinking outside of the box because if the war changes, the techniques and the tactics change. That doesn't mean we don't know techniques. Just if, if, if your industry changes, can you do the same thing over again? Let me, is your industry changing? I don't even know what your industry is. It's changing. So in the intelligence community, the support's very high. There are some places and conventional forces that I do not get asked to give this lecture. But anybody, really what I'm knocking is the interrogations. And anyone who's done interrogation in the military, if they publicly oppose what I say, behind closed doors, they're like, you're right. You're right, man. You're just right. So I don't care. Because the people who oppose me, they're opposing it for the wrong reason. It's status quo. It's, it, it's, it, it's, 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 you, you know what the problem is? They don't want to put a priority on the person. In the military, it's process. Process, process, process. Plug a new one in. Get a new recruit. Plug them in, right? But this interrogation is about the person we've got to find the people who can psychologically dive into these conversations so we can't just I mean I can't take somebody off the street who goes I want to be an interrogator sounds good let's go like we're not even testing them which says process and I would just argue it needs to be focused on person so I get some blowback a little but not not much. 
I think I, where's, yes, right here. So um, you said that this technique works in about 60 some percent of the 65. cases. 65. 65%. So could you identify a common thread in the 35% where it doesn't work? I can, absolutely. You think that 35% doesn't haunt me every single day? <laughs> I know this sounds crazy. The lower the ranking, the dumber the prisoner, the less effective this technique is. Because those prisoners, they'll listen to me, and in their mind they're going, ah, man, I smell what you're cooking. I just can't do it. You know what? I'm too stupid to take a risk because I know I'm dumb. And if my boss wanted me to take this risk, my boss would have done it. Just go get my boss. Like, and I'm not going to give it to him. Like, I'm, I, I don't want to think outside of the box. I don't want to take a risk and, because it's such, like, you can't turn this decision down. I'm going to help you. Your life's going to be better. And they still don't do it. The higher ranking, A, they have something to lose. They have chips to play. They are thinking outside of the box. They see a future. So it is based really on their rank in the fight, in the war, and their level of intelligence. Which, uh, it's just a certain war and a certain group of people are so dumb that I struggle to interrogate them. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes. You, you, talked about, you talked about training uh, other interrogators to work with you, uh -huh. and, uh, and you've talked about having to put aside distractions. Uh -huh. How do you train people to do that? I'm just in meditation, for example, you're, I know how hard that is. How do you, how do you effectively train your trainees to, to function at the same level you do in putting aside distractions? So what we teach is there are six categories of distractions. Um, if anybody wants, I have a short paper, doesn't cost, just shoot me an email, I'll shoot you an email back, and that's all you're going to get from me. You're not getting on the list of the distractions, the description of the distractions. They come in six categories. Those categories of your distractions are the portals of empathy for everybody else in the world. If things are distracting me right now, those are the ways you get into my portal of empathy. That's how you find out where I sit, where, I, what, where my shoes are. So what we tell people is if your agenda is your biggest distraction, my agenda, trans, I don't care what your agenda you want it to be, change your agenda, take away that agenda of getting the cell, doing the persuasion to your agenda in any conversation should be identifying those portals of empathy in a conversation with the person you're having. Boom. You right there, you will triple your listening. Last thing is, what I'm going to say next. That's the big distraction. Oop, I'm, I want to say, I want to say this. What you should do is trust that you're going to come up with a comment or a question in a conversation. Do not think of anything to say until that person speaks their last sentence and make your statement just on the last statement that they make. That way you can clear your mind because you'll start thinking of things you want to say three minutes earlier. Let me give you a little hint. If you're talking to someone and they're going, I, I, I just, what? just stop talking because that person is not listening to anything you're saying because they're, they, they're thinking about what they're going to say. So don't think about what you're going to say in a conversation until that thing's wrapped and then make it just off that last comment will even demonstrate more empathy because that's what I just said. And when you make a, a question or comment off of that, it goes, I'm like, wow, you're listening to me. Who's next? Yes. We're going to take one last question. Before we do that, I want to again thank everybody for coming. You can help us when you leave if you would take your trash so that people don't trip on it out there. I'm going to ask Eric if he'll step down here so if anybody 
was too shy to ask him a question. I want two questions. This lady right here, this, and right there, both came up at the same time. Can okay. I give two more? Absolutely. Two questions, and then I'll hang around and give me one. I want to wrap up as well. Yes, ma'am. Mine is quite sympathy and ha quite simple, and has to do with empathy. Did you ever see or talk to Bam Bam again? I did. What? The question, did I ever see or talk to Bam Bam again? You know, I went on the tour where I had to teach this technique. Well, one of the first stops was the Delta Force compound. And when I get there, I get, so that's how I actually got the real nuts and bolts of like, man, we couldn't find him, we this and that. And Bam Bam, who is my hero, said, in the hole, we found three things. We found $750,000 cash. That goes to civil affairs. We found a, a Glock pistol. That went to President Bush. And we got a box of Cuban cigars. And Bam Bam said, and here's your Cuban cigar. The guy is my hero. And I just want to think, when you talk about what's awesome about the military, we had a Vietnam veteran, another Vietnam. Ask those gentlemen or women, ask them how old they were when they were going through all that stuff. It's amazing the accomplishments of the young Americans when they, when they served this country. I was 31 when we tracked down Saddam, and Bam Bam was 33. I mean, Bam Bam was leading the biggest hunt ever. And, and he was a 33-year-old major. And, and it's just, it's awesome when you think back, and like, well, we were just kids. But you know what? That's that responsibility that, and the pride that the Army gives you, or, and the military as a whole. Yes, ma'am. I just wondered, specifically with regard to the Saddam people that you interviewed, what happened to the people who broke? How, how did you protect them? Did anyone suffer afterwards, you know? Can I, can I, can I, I just want, I need a minute, because this is important. You have four brothers. You don't have three, you have four. Well, that fourth brother, he got involved in the insurgency. Here's my technique, here's what I did. I would always say, I need you to take me to that brother. Man, I'm not taking you to my brother. I don't want to get my brother in trouble. Okay, take me to your brother's bosses, and I don't need your brother. The prisoner would always say, man, if I take you to my brother's bosses, they'll know it was me, and they'll kill me, and then they'll kill my brother. They'll kill my whole family. And I would always give control to the prisoner and say, what do we need to do? And the prisoner would say, listen, I know you know about all these bad guys, but there's bad guys you don't know about. And there's a group over here. I'll take you to this person's house. That person knows my brother's bosses. If you'll go to that house and then immediately go from that house to my brother's bosses, they'll think that guy took you to my brother's boss and they won't know it was me and they won't kill my brother. And I'll look at those prisoners and I'll go, man, that's a great idea. That's smart. But here's the deal. Your brother won't have a boss, and I need to make sure your brother doesn't rejoin the insurgency. And the only way I know your brother's not going to rejoin that insurgency is I'm going to let you go home and you tell him. You tell him the interrogator in the blue shirt knows every single house that you or your brother could ever go to, because I've got all that information, and if you ever step across the wrong side of this line again, I will go to every single house you've ever stepped foot in. But as long as you and your brother don't, you're not only going free, we're not going after your brother, you both are off the list of people we're going after. Who wouldn't break? I promise, not only will you break, you'll break like that. I have to protect my prisoners. I have to, and it's not because I like them, it's because it's the only way this system works. So people say, what's the key to a good interrogator? Key to a good interrogator. I have to identify the needs of my prisoners. If I identify and address all their needs, they're going to address all my needs. Eric, thank you so much. Thank you.